In the previous video, we saw how water moved into the queen's chamber and then up into the king's chamber. From the king's chamber, water traveled up through both king's chamber vents. Before we see how water exited the Great Pyramid water pump, we will take a closer look at the water pumping process in the Great Pyramid structure. By examining the water pumping process in detail inside the Great Pyramid structure, we will see how the many features of the Great Pyramid support the interpretation of the Great Pyramid being built to be a machine to pump water. We will see how the coffer, antechamber, the niche in the Queen's Chamber, the Queen's Chamber vents, and the pair of long grooves high in the Grand Gallery were used by the Great Pyramid machine to pump water. At the end of the last video, we left off in the King's Chamber, so we will revisit that chamber to get a fuller understanding of the water pumping process in that chamber. Air is soluble in water. The air and the air cushion in the king's chamber will be gradually absorbed in the water. This air cushion must be maintained for the Great Pyramid water pump to operate properly. How was additional air introduced into the king's chamber allowing the size of the air cushion to be properly maintained? Also, what was the coffer for? Why have a stone box in this chamber? What was the antechamber for? These questions are all interrelated, and the answers are all interrelated as well. Although now heavily damaged, the antechamber had several sliding stones in slots. These missing stones were once part of an automatic valve that allowed air in the Grand Gallery to be introduced into the King's Chamber when necessary. We contend that the coffer was part of a float system and the coffer was connected to the automatic valve system. The size of the air cushion determined the position of the coffer as a float. This provides feedback for the antechamber valve, allowing this valve to open and close when needed. It is this float and valve system that maintains the proper amount of air in the king's chamber. Air is soluble in water and the air cushion is slowly absorbed into the water in the king's chamber. The coffer and the antechamber were used to maintain the proper air cushion in the king's chamber. When the air cushion diminishes, the coffer acting as a float would move up. This would cause the antechamber valve to open, allowing water to exit from the king's chamber into the grand gallery. As water exits through the antechamber, a stone was moved. When this stone moved, it opened a valve allowing air from the Grand Gallery to enter the King's Chamber. This process replenished the air cushion in the King's Chamber. With so much of the valve system missing, there is scholarly debate as to the exact configuration of the valve components, but this animation gives an explanation of the purpose of the coffer and antechamber. The purpose of the three stones in the antechamber was to help maintain a tight seal between the moving elements of the valves. The supporting components for the coffer are not shown for clarity. The direct physical evidence supports the idea that the Great Pyramid was a water pump. The Queen's Chamber has the same issue. How is the air cushion maintained in the Queen's Chamber that is consistent with the remaining direct physical evidence? If the Queen's Chamber becomes waterlogged, the pump will not work properly. The Queen's Chamber does have the niche. This enigmatic feature in the Queen's Chamber has a rather interesting explanation that gives this feature a functional purpose. It was the area that housed the finely cut elements of an automatic valve that replenished air into this chamber as needed. Virtually all of this mechanism is now missing. There is speculation, based on early Arab writing, that there was once, at one time, a coffer in the Queen's Chamber. If so, it would have been used as a float to provide feedback for the valve to open and close when needed. This float and valve assembly would have kept the air cushion in the queen's chamber replenished. When the air cushion diminishes, the float would move up, opening the valve, allowing air to enter. 
the, this chamber from behind the valve. In this view, the wall containing the niche is removed. To see the niche, we will replace that wall and look into the queen's chamber from the opposite side. By rotating our view, we will look into the queen's chamber to see the niche. The purpose of the niche was to house the finely cut stone components that consisted of a valve and float which automatically replenished air in the queen's chamber. Looking into this chamber, we will remove the water. The niche is a large cutting in the wall that almost reaches the top of the chamber. There is a hole in the niche that extends into the rough cut masonry of the Great Pyramid. The coffer, or float, was attached to the valve mechanism. This float provided feedback for the valve and the niche. When the water level rose too high, the valve would open, allowing water to exit the chamber and air to enter, replenishing the air cushion. We will remove the walls and ceiling stones to better see how the valve operated. Then we will remove the water and coffer acting as a float. This will allow a closer examination of the components and operation of this automatic valve. We will also view the automatic valve mechanism in cross-section. This will allow us to see this valve's water and air passages. The lower passage is for water and the upper passage is for air. When the water rises, the float causes both passages to open. The movable components of the valve is connected to the float. The float provides feedback for the valve to operate. The movable stone in this valve would be traveling along finely cut grooves like those in the antechamber. Virtually all of this finely cut stonework comprising this automatic valve have been destroyed years ago. By viewing the water in the Queen's Chamber in cross-section, we can best see the operation of this automatic valve in the niche. When opened, the valve allows water to exit the Queen's Chamber and also allows air to enter this chamber. When the water cushion diminishes, it causes the water to rise too high. This causes the float to rise, opening the valve to let water out and air into the queen's chamber. The supporting components that hold the valve mechanism in place are not shown for clarity. This configuration is shown to give an idea as to how the niche function and serve the purpose of replenishing the air cushion in the Queen's Chamber. Although the exact configuration is now unknown, this interpretation of the direct physical evidence supports the contention of the Great Pyramid being purpose-built to pump water. This description gives a functional purpose to the niche and provides an explanation as to how the air cushion is maintained. There is not enough time in these short videos to explore every aspect of these automatic valve and float mechanisms in the King's and Queen's Chambers, but my book, The Great Pyramid Prosperity Machine, goes into great detail on this subject. But what about the Queen's Chamber vents? What were they for? The bottom ends of the Queen's Chamber vents were sealed shut. The upper ends of these two vents are still sealed shut. How do two vents with both ends sealed help pump water? The Queen's Chamber vents were only used during the mid stages of construction. Water was being pumped up by the subterranean water pump, but this pump could not pump water to the height necessary to finish the entire Great Pyramid. The pump could only pump water to about the height of the Grand Gallery, but water was needed to be moved higher to continue the construction process level by level. Water was needed to finish the level containing the upper end of the Grand Gallery. Water was needed to float in place the massive stones that were placed above the Grand Gallery. But again, the subterranean construction pump could not pump water to that height. 
It didn't need to. During the intermediate stages of construction, the way water was moved higher than the Grand Gallery was by using the Queen's Chamber vents. The subterranean construction pump would fill the Grand Gallery. The workers would manually open the non-automatic valve, allowing water to move into the Queen's Chamber with tremendous force. This would compress the air in the chamber. The compressed air would move water into and up the Queen's Chamber vents. This water would keep the construction pond full and supply water to the water locks so that construction could continue finishing the Grand Gallery and the levels above the Grand Gallery. The Queen's Chamber vents do not exit the Great Pyramid. These vents were only used until the Grand Gallery was assembled and the stones of the levels above the Grand Gallery were completed. After the Queen's Chamber vents were no longer needed, they were both sealed up at both ends. The upper end of these vents shows the last level these vents were needed. This construction process is fully explored in my first book, Lost Technologies of the Great Pyramid, and in our first DVD documentary, How the Great Pyramid Was Built Using Water Locks and Barges. The lower pump provided water for the construction process up until construction reached the top of the Grand Gallery. Then, the Queen's Chamber vents were used during the intermediary stages of construction. The passage between the floors of the King's and Queen's Chamber was not used. The gauge indicates the relative pressure of the air in the Queen's Chamber. The construction pump moved water into the Grand Gallery. The valves operated as they would when the Great Pyramid water pump was completed. How the non-automatic valve is opened, letting water into the horizontal passage, will be described later. The Queen's Chamber vents were necessary to allow water to move higher than the Grand Gallery, allowing the assembly of the King's Chamber, the relieving chambers, and the top end of the Grand Gallery. The water pumping process is slowed down for clarity. When the massive water piston in the Grand Gallery moves down, water is pushed into the Queen's Chamber, compressing the air in that chamber to a high pressure. That pressurized air moves water up through the Queen's Chamber vents, allowing the construction process to continue. The construction process is described in detail in my first book and our first DVD documentary. The Queen's Chamber vents were necessary during this stage of construction. The Queen's Chamber vents allowed water to be moved higher than was possible using the construction pump alone. When construction reached the height of the upper ends of the Queen's Chamber vents, these vents were no longer needed. After the Queen's Chamber vents served their purpose, they were sealed up on both ends. Pumping water in this manner was satisfactory to continue the construction process. After construction, the water pump was fully operational, utilizing electrolysis and a vacuum in the Grand Gallery. This allowed the Great Pyramid water pump to be much more powerful. This is the height of construction utilizing the Queen's Chamber vents. The original builders were geniuses. Why were there two vents? Some say that doesn't make sense when only one vent or water pipe was sufficient. No, two vents were needed. Think about it. While one vent was being extended, as the construction process continued level by level, the other vent was still operational and used to pump water. That way, the construction process continued non-stop. The Great Pyramid was built level by level. During the intermediary stages of construction, the Queen's Chamber vents were utilized. The reason there were two Queen's Chamber vents was so that one could be extended while the other one was used to supply water for the construction process. This procedure took place on the construction pond as the level of the Great Pyramid was assembled and then the level above that was assembled. We will look at this process in detail, but first we will watch the water move in the unfinished Grand Gallery. This has not been seen since the construction of the Great Pyramid. 
Water moved down the Grand Gallery, compressing air in the Queen's Chamber. That compressed air moves water up the Queen's Chamber vents, allowing the construction process to continue. The water exiting the upper end of the Queen's Chamber vents keeps the construction pond full and supplies water for the water locks. If water is surging through a vent, it cannot be extended. So a removable plug is inserted into a vent. This plug stops the water from moving through the vent and then the vent can be extended. After the removable plug is inserted, additional stones can be set in place, extending the vent to the next higher level. Stones pre-cut to extend the vent are set in place. This ensures the opening of the vent will remain above the construction pond as additional water causes the level of the pond to rise to the next higher level as construction proceeds non-stop. After one queen chamber vent is extended, the plug is removed from that vent and moved to the other queen's chamber vent. The process is repeated and that vent is also extended. This is the reason there are two vents in the queen's chamber and two vents in the king's chamber. Now we will take a look at the Grand Gallery. We already examined how water flowed through this chamber, but now we will look at the process in greater detail. How is the non-automatic valve opened and closed at the proper time and duration? How is the upper check valve opened to release the vacuum at the proper time? What are those two long slots in the Grand Gallery for? The answers to these three questions are all interrelated. The long slots on either side of the Grand Gallery had a functional purpose. That purpose was to control the movement of a float in the Grand Gallery. This float, which was like a barge, moved up and down in unison with the rising and falling of the water in this chamber. The float had guides on each side that were made to enter the long slots built into each side of the Grand Gallery. This float provided a means for the non-automatic valve to operate and the upper check valve to open, releasing the vacuum. When the water level moved up to the proper height, the barge caused linkage to open the non-automatic valve and the upper check valve. After the water and float uh, moved down, linkage caused both of these two valves to close. There are two long grooves in the Grand Gallery. These grooves are on both sides of the Grand Gallery and are high up on the walls. The purpose of these grooves was to guide a float that rose and fell as the water in the Grand Gallery moved up and down. These grooves guided the float as it moved higher and lower in the Grand Gallery. The float was like a barge and had protrusions on each side of the float. These protrusions were designed to interface with the grooves. The grooves and protrusions kept the float properly positioned as it moved in the Grand Gallery. This float provided feedback to the valves so they would open and close at the proper time and duration. Linkage connected the float to the valves so that these valves would open and close when needed. When the float moved up, to the proper position, the two valves opened. When the float moved down to the proper position, the two valves closed. When the float moved up to its upper end of travel, the valves opened. When the float moved down to its lower end of travel, the valves closed. The float provided feedback for the timing of these two valves and also provided the force necessary to open and close these valves. There is scholarly debate as to the configuration of the linkage. The linkage is not shown for clarity. The electrolysis plates are turned on and off using the same feedback system. When the water level in the Grand Gallery moves down, the float moves down. The float activates linkage that turns on the electrolysis plates. The electrolysis plates are energized based on the position of the float. The float also provides feedback which allow the electrolysis plates to be turned off at the proper time. This feedback system is similar to the float in the tank of a toilet. 
The float in the toilet's water tank causes the valve in the toilet's water tank to open and close at the proper time. The float in the grand gallery provides the feedback and control of many of the actions occurring in the grand gallery. The position of the float in the grand gallery determined when the electrolysis plates were energized or de-energized. When the float moved up to its upper end of travel, the electrolysis plates were de-energized. When the float moved down to its lower end of travel, the electrolysis plates were energized. The float's position provided feedback for the electrolysis plates and also powered the linkage that turned on and off these plates. After the electrolysis process, the hydrogen and oxygen gases were ignited at the proper time. The timing of this event was also accomplished using the position of the barge-like float in the Grand Gallery. The float provided the feedback for the spark to occur at the proper time. There are many ways in which the spark could have been created. One method would be to use what is called the Lord Kelvin electric spark generator. Using this device, an intense electric spark is created by running water. It is fascinating. Another method to create a spark is to use a low voltage ignition system. This is a device that uses relatively low voltage that creates spark when the contacts of a switch are opened. They were used in early ignition systems for gas engines. The switch was inside the cylinder. I have a working antique gasoline engine with this type of ignition. The switch opens in the cylinder creating a spark. So the creation of a spark deep inside the Great Pyramid is not very difficult at all. When the barge moves to the upper end of its travel, it opens the upper check valve and the non-automatic valve. This allows the water piston to move down. When the barge reaches its lower end of travel, it causes the electrolysis plates to be energized. When the electrolysis process is over, the gases are ignited. The timing for all of these events are determined by the position of the barge. The original builders were geniuses. The electrolysis plates are only energized about 20% of the time during the operation of the upper pump. They are energized just long enough to make available the hydrogen and oxygen gases to ignite, which produces a powerful vacuum. Yet these electrolysis plates deep inside the Great Pyramid's Grand Gallery require a power source. What could possibly be the power source for these electrolysis plates and how is that power source consistent with the direct physical evidence? We know that the electrolysis plates are energized and de-energized based on the position of the float inside the Grand Gallery. This large float was an integral part of the process of powering the electrolysis plates. At the upper end of the Grand Gallery is a platform called the Step. This platform's purpose was to be the location for the equipment that generated the electricity needed to power the electrolysis plates. This location would allow the equipment to remain dry because water does not reach the height of the step in the Grand Gallery. With this equipment being lost to the sands of time, it is difficult to describe exactly how it operated, but the electrical generating equipment must be powered. The generating equipment was powered by using the movement of the float in the Grand Gallery. The float was large and heavy. The float was connected to the generating equipment located on the step with linkage. As the water piston moved down, the float moved down. The linkage pulled on an apparatus associated with the electrical generating equipment, which powered this equipment, thereby generating electricity. Everything about the construction and operation of the Great Pyramid water pump is the height of efficiency. Probably when the float rose with the water in the Grand Gallery, the linkage pushed on the apparatus associated with the electrical generating equipment located on the step. Therefore, the float was used to generate electricity during both directions of travel. 
so electrical power was generated as the float lowered in the Grand Gallery and also when the float rose in the Grand Gallery. The step was the location for the electrical generating equipment which was connected to the float using linkage. As the float lowered, it activated the linkage and powered the electrical generating equipment. The upward movement of the float and linkage system also powered the electrical generating equipment on the step. The electrical generator was powered by the float as it moved in both directions. There is scholarly debate as to the configuration of the linkage, therefore the linkage is not shown for clarity. In this video, we examined in much greater detail the operation of the water pump housed inside the Great Pyramid structure. We learned the coffer and antechamber serve the purpose of maintaining the proper air cushion in the King's Chamber. An explanation of the Queen's Chamber niche was provided, discussing how the niche housed a valve to replenish air in the Queen's Chamber. We found out how the float controlled the timing and operation of the valves in the Grand Gallery. We learned why the King's and Queen's Chamber both had two vents. This was necessary to allow the construction process to continue while one vent was being extended. Also, the Queen's Chamber vents were used only during the intermediary stage of construction. The vents of the Queen's Chamber were not needed after the Grand Gallery was completed. We also learned that the movement of the heavy float powered the electrical generating equipment used to energize the electrolysis plates. Yet there is still more to discuss. How was the water pump started? How was the siphon between the enclosure pond and the descending passage primed? How was the Great Pyramid water pump stopped? How did water exit the Great Pyramid water pump? How was water delivered to the point of use? What was the pumped water for? Why did the Great Pyramid water pump stop pumping water? This video gave a more detailed look into the interior of the Great Pyramid to better understand its operation as a massive and powerful water pumping system. The next video will explore additional features concerning how water entered the Great Pyramid water pump, how water exited the Great Pyramid water pump, and many other related subjects.